Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's my first visit to Belgrade. I hope it won't be my last. Uh, I'm looking forward to um, the interactions that we have with uh, uh, the audience today as we share our ideas about open science and its role, potential role, in, uh, for uh, universities. Uh, these are the things that I'm going to uh, talk about in the next 30 minutes. I'm going to give uh, the view of LEM, uh, the League of European Research Universities, 24 research intensive universities across the continent of Europe. I chair the um, scholarly communications group of uh, uh, LERU uh, and we are tasked with leading LERU's approach to open science across those 24 uh, universities. So the views I'm going to be sharing with you today are the views of the 24 rectors of uh, LERU as to how they can or would find challenges in implementing open science principles and practice. So I'm going to talk about cultural change, which is a really important part, uh, theme that the Lowry Rectors have identified as being an important uh, starting point for any university or country wanting to embrace open science principles. Then I'm very briefly going to go through eight, the eight pillars of open science as defined by the European uh, Commission and give you, share with you Larry's views on how universities can adopt these eight uh, uh, principles and the eight pillars, and then try and draw the, um, talk to some sort of conclusion. So these are the eight pillars of uh, open science that have been defined by the European uh, uh, Commission. And I'm going to talk very briefly about each of them in turn, with examples, mainly from my university, in London on the changes we've introduced in order to deliver these eight principles. So the future of scholarly publishing, uh, two about uh, research data, the European Open Science Cloud, and then FAIR data, how you make your data available for sharing and reuse following FAIR principles. Uh, skills development, uh, research integrity, how do you ensure that the principles you're following in an open science world are the best possible ones that give you uh, results which are verifiable, reproducible, and um, respected by the academic community. Then, uh, what do you do with your reward systems in your university? How do you reward open science practices? How do you get uh, recognition for following open science principles? Uh, a little something about metrics and evaluation, <coughs> which the Commission has called old metrics. And then um, a, a little something on the eighth pillar, citizen science, how universities can engage with the general public in order for the general public to become researchers alongside university researchers and be part of the research process, redefining what the role of universities is in a modern European uh, society. <coughs> so let's look at the first uh, point that the lower rectors made. That um, open science requires a really deep-seated cultural change in your organisation. And if you don't make this cultural change first, you're not going to be able successfully to embed open science practices in your institution. So we have produced an open science roadmap. It's an open access document, and this is the URL for that uh, document. And I led the uh, uh, working party that produced the, the 41. Uh, recommendations. The main recommendation before you start looking at those eight pillars of open science is what do you do to prepare your university to accept radical change. Universities on the whole tend not to like radical change because we're an elderly institute, my university is nearly 200 years old, it's the third oldest university in England after Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, and we have a radical tradition. We were, we were invented in 1826 to introduce radical change into the English university system. But even my university finds radical change difficult to uh, embrace on uh, day one. So what is the secret uh, of, of introducing cultural change? Well, in order to introduce open science into your organization, the lower rectors feel you need to do something uh, like this. 
you need someone who will lead. So you need a leader in your university who is going to be the leader for, for uh, open science. And in my university, that's me. That's why I'm a pro vice provost. I'm responsible for introducing open science changes in all those eight areas of open science into the organization. You have to manage the change. It doesn't just happen on its own. You don't just issue a series of diktats and then expect people to follow them. And certainly in my university, it doesn't, life doesn't work like that. That would be the, absolutely the worst thing to do, just to tell people what to do that. in the UK. That, that, really, that really works. So you need to engage with your academics. So it's a conversation, a discussion, a partnership, a collaboration. Open science is a process not a single event, where you're engaging with your community and convincing them of the benefits of changing the way they work. And you do this by inspiring them, by informing them, and getting your plan integrated into the strategic plan of the organisation. So your plan becomes the university's plan. And you're working uh, on this as a community uh, together. And if you want to look at it uh, another way, uh, you can think of it as a table of uh, actions, and you uh, undertake the actions in this order. You, uh, you appoint your leader, you have um, developed targeted measures, so you have a plan, you're going to manage that change, you know what you're going to do. You implement those changes with transparency so that everybody knows what you're doing, and you're not simply issuing a series of diktats and expecting people to uh, undertake things that you say, and then you build as a result of this openness and this transparency, trust and confidence from your audience, which will mean they're more likely to engage with the radical changes that you're going to uh, um, undertake. So for introducing uh, cultural change in your organization, these are the four things, four recommendations that the known rectors, the vice chancellors, of these 24 universities said you should do. Point a city manager to lead in your university across the whole university on open science approaches. You develop this program of cultural change which encourages people <coughs> to think differently about the way they work. And you establish an advocacy program like the workshop today is an advocacy program trying to engage with the new community about what the benefits of open science are, once you've introduced those principles into your organisation. And you draw up a communications strategy which enables the whole university to understand and become familiar with what you're doing. If you want to put cultural change into practice, these are the first four steps that the lower rectors felt were necessary in their universities in order to deliver the kind of radical change that uh, the open science uh, introduces. So let's look at the eight pillars of open science and look in a bit of detail how some universities, mainly my own university in, in central London, <coughs> all we've done to uh, develop services and facilities around uh, the eight principles of open science that the European uh, Commission has um, identified. And we'll start with the first one, the future of uh, scholarly uh, communication. And in our Nehru roadmap, the, of those 41 recommendations we made, five of them uh, refer to the future of scholarly publishing. So my university has set up an open access press. It's the first fully open access university press in the UK. Uh, I'm the head of the press. It's a department of the library, so I run it alongside the library. And when I talk to my academic colleagues and researchers in UCL about the possibility of establishing a press. These were the types of points that they made in that discussion. So I talked about a year, a year and a half, with academics in the organization before I um, um, asked for money to uh, develop the uh, uh, press. And these are some of the points that came up in uh, discussion. And let me point particularly to two of them. So in the center of the diagram at the bottom, establishing the press would be consistent with open science principles, but it would be because it's an open access press and you remove cost to, uh, 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 at the end user point of view, from the end user's point of view, you remove cost as a barrier uh, to usage. Uh, and the one in the middle, uh, you deliver global impact because more people 
are able to read the outputs of the research that you're paying for, that the state is paying for, if the state is paying the wages of academics through, uh, through block grants. So this is the result of uh, UCL Press as a, um, following our um, establishment in, in, in 2015. We're, we're downloading our, our outputs. They're downloaded in, in 222 countries across the world. So practically every country in the world, every territory in the world. Even in North Korea, we have 15 downloads from North Korea. It's the only contact my university has with North Korea, is downloads of the press titles. And how many downloads do you think we get from Serbia? Do you think we get any downloads from Serbia? I'm seeing some shaking heads, some people nodding. Give me a figure, anyone want to guess how many Serbians have downloaded UCL press titles? It's 1,500 downloads from Serbia. All our, all our titles are in English. So we do publish in non-English uh, languages, but at the moment the list is entirely uh, uh, English language, and so we have 1,500 downloads from, uh, from uh, uh, Serbia. And we get about 100,000 downloads a month. From the, from the titles that we're uh, uh, producing. Now, of course, in uh, an open access uh, world, other people have other views on what the future of scholarly publishing looks like. My university's view was to found a university press and to undertake your own publishing. On the grounds that this could be open access <coughs> on day one and you would get those kind of benefits that I've been uh, illustrating those large numbers of donors from countries all across the world. So you're sharing your research with society across the world. A another way of looking at future scholarly publishing is, is to adopt the principles in Plan S, which is being developed by, the, by Science Europe, encouraged by the European Commission, to change current commercial publishing practices. So not to invent publishing, again, the new publishing um, um, consortium, like UCL Press, but to change the existing publishing model. And Plan S is about making certain things that we do at the moment in terms of publishing in hybrid journals, for example, publishing an open access uh, version of an article alongside a subscription version of an article in the same uh, journal. Um, that practice was introduced as a means of transitioning to a fully open access well, that was the point of having hybrid journals. The fact is that hybrid journals have not delivered the wholesale change that open science requires. And so Plan S is saying that in future, certainly from the 1st of January 2020, that kind of hybrid publishing is not going to be possible because the funders who have signed up to Plan S and our funder in the UK, UKRI, UK Research and Innovation is a signatory to Plan S, the Wellcome Trust, which is Europe's largest uh, biomedical uh, funder, who live just around the corner from my university in um, Houston Road. They've also recently signed to the principles of Plan S as well. So this is another way of changing the future of scholarly <coughs> publishing by making it not possible to uh, publish under uh, current uh, in the current publishing regime um, uh, in a hybrid uh, journal, but to encourage pure open access publishing from day one. And an implementation plan, which will govern how Plan S is actually implemented in um, uh, member states who uh, are in receipt of funding from these, uh, from these research funders, uh, will be um, issued just before Christmas, and we'll be able to comment on the implementation uh, plan. So the second and third pillars of open science as identified by the Commission are to do with research data, research data management and fair data and 10 of those 41 recommendations are uh, about uh, research data. Uh, and then one of the major developments which the Commission is funding with £300 million up to 2020 then generously handing the ability to fund that project over to the member states after 2020 is EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud, and the EOSC is being <coughs> launched in uh, Vienna, formerly launched in Vienna, since Austria has the presidency of the council. 
at the moment. Uh, that's being launched later this month. And the EOSC is uh, an attempt to bring together in one front end uh, open research data, so not simply the publication, the, the article or the book, but the underlying data on which that publication is based. EOSC is about aggregating that uh, data, or at least the metadata describing that data, into one front end into the European Open Science Cloud and making all that material available for sharing and reuse. So in you, in your universities, uh, after today, I'm suggesting you go back and say, how are we as a university going to contribute to the European Open Science Cloud? It isn't open just to member states. My own country will no longer be a member state after the 29th of March. We're still going to contribute to the European Open Science Cloud, and have to pay for it, of course, but uh, we'll do that because we want to do that. The same option is open to Serbia, and I would suggest it is an absolute requisite. If you want to be considered seriously as a research-performing nation, that you do interface with the European Open Science Cloud. So the question is how, what are the rules of engagement by which my university can make its data and research assets available for searching and reuse through the cloud and through each of these three areas of activity that are currently ongoing. So there's a, a, a level of activity around data, the culture and fair data, one of the requisites of sharing your data and making it available through the Open Science Cloud is that it is, is fair. It meets the fair principles, that it's findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Uh, if your data is there, it's then eligible for being made available as open data through the cloud. But you need to train your researchers to produce their data or to convince them that there are benefits in making their data fair and documenting the process as the prelude to sharing it with, uh, uh, through, the, through the cloud. And that's quite a challenge to try and get a, a bunch of researchers who currently don't really uh, in my university, they do document their data, but it isn't by default open data. And if I went and said, well, is your data fair? 95% of them would say, I don't know what you're talking about. So that's the level of challenge to move from where we are now to where we want to be, which is to have all data fair and to make it available for sharing and reuse as open data through the cloud. And who's responsible for making that change? Well, the researcher, obviously, because they are producing the data. But it tends, in a university, it would tend, in, certainly in Western Europe, it would tend to be the library who has an advocacy team or has set up an advocacy team that goes out to train people in uh, research data management and the principles and benefits of making their data fair. So what I've done in my library is to establish a new team of research data librarians who do that, who do all the advocacy and do all the training to make um, researchers' data available for sharing through the open science uh, uh, cloud. There are a number of other things that you need uh, to do, and I've listed some of them here on the slide. You learn much more from the outputs of the LEARN project, which was an EU-funded project, and I uh, led the project, and Ignacy, who is speaking uh, later today, was also a, a member of that project. One of the uh, outputs was a model research data management policy. So, so go back to your university and say, do we have a research data management policy? Is there a university? policy, and what, if we don't have one, what should that policy say in, in terms of uh, roles and responsibilities, uh, how costs are made, and where curation, long-term curation, is going to be uh, possible, uh, so that we can share our data through um, uh, vehicles like the European Open Science Cloud. So policy development is really an important starting point, too, if you're going to embrace um, open data, which is what the um, um, principles of open science say that you should do. Skills, I've already talked about uh, a little bit. We are introducing skills training sessions in my organization, and we're starting with early career scientists, so our PhD students. And this is a picture of a group of PhD students in my organization being trained in open access principles and 
practice and uh, research data in vulnerable training suites. If you capture them young, early in their career, uh, they will become the next generation of um, permanent uh, researchers in the organization, and they will embrace openness as the norm. And what we've said, well, David Bogle, Professor David Bogle, who's my opposite number, as head of the doctoral school in UCL, what he has said to me is that he wants to make open science and openness one of the principal characteristics of the UCL doctoral experience. So we are producing researchers who see open as the default, rather than the exception. And that's a really great thing for the head of the doctoral school to say, but we've, we, I've been talking to him about open science, <laughs> for the last two or three years, and he's come to accept that this is the future of research. This is what research looks like. He wants his researchers, who he is training and producing, to be open by default. And you, you start that early by getting them. As soon as they come into the doctoral school, you start training them in open science principles and, and practices. So I, I talked, uh, the next pillar is on research and integrity. How do you ensure that the, the processes that you're following do follow best practice in uh, research uh, performance. I talked about the research data management policy. Uh, you really need a parallel policy too. I'm sure you universities have one, uh, a research integrity code that will emb embrace these eight principles of open science. My university has its own research integrity code, which uh, sets the framework for how you do good and virtuous uh, research in the organization, the ethical principles that you embrace, and the ethical practices that you follow when you're using personal or sensitive data, for, for, for example. You can either write your own uh, research integrity code and ensure that it embraces the eight principles of open science, the eight principles that I'm talking about this morning, or you could use a, a ready-made code, the pan-European code, the ALIA code, would work perfectly well in a research organization which didn't have its own research integrity uh, policy. But having a, an overarching policy which embraces open science principles is a really important part of, of doing good uh, uh, research. So we're on the homeward stretch now. We're into the last three pillars of open science. And the next one is uh, rewards. Now, why, why, why is reward uh, such an important principle? It's an important principle because you're, you're asking the, your researchers to make a massive number of changes very quickly. You're asking them to publish differently, <coughs> not to publish in high impact factor journals, not to publish in high impact journals. Plan S means that uh, three quarters of the journals in which um, academics currently published will not be eligible for APC funding once Plan S is introduced. It is introduced in its present um, form. We'll have to see what the implementation plan uh, says, but uh, the level of APC is too high, or the, there is an embargo period in the, um, in, in the organization of the journal. That would be invalid under Plan S as a vehicle for publishing. So Plan S being implemented in its present form will completely change the way that um, academics can publish their research. You're asking them to share their research data. You're training them how to describe their data to make their data fair for sharing and reuse. So it's only fair that you should reward them for making these massive changes. So that's why rewards is a principle of open science and in my university, we have done this through changing the promotions procedure. So we have a promotions procedure, and it's available as an open access document. Here is a link at the bottom of the screen. And I spent two years of working with our uh, human resources department to change the academic promotions framework to embed openness as a core criterion in the request that an academic can make for uh, promotion. Uh, and we were so successful, actually, that openness is now a core criterion that, uh, that has to be present in every application for promotion in order to be considered a serious, uh, serious uh, proposal. There was no uh, mention of um, openness in, in the earlier promotions framework. It was all about 
publishing in high impact factor journals. So I had to take all that wording and all those thoughts out of the policy because they're not open science principles. German impact factors tell you absolutely nothing, nothing about the quality of an individual article in a, a journal. And since they don't do that, you shouldn't use them for promotion and you shouldn't use them as a mark of academic quality against individual articles because they don't mean anything. And that's a false assumption to say that a journal impact factor equals every article in this issue of a journal is of the same quality. Because we know that half the articles in commercial journals are not read at all. So you can't use the impact factor to say that article is high impact because it's got that impact factor because nobody could have read it. And why are you rewarding that? So those are, those, that's the kind of change that you would need to make in your promotions procedures in order to introduce open science practices. And that's what we've done. So in, in the um, UCL promotions procedure, which is listed here on the screen, uh, we, we don't talk about journal impact factors. We have signed the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, which forbids the use of journal impact factors officially as a, a criterion for appointment to the university or for promotion once you are in the university or for appraisal once you're being evaluated annually uh, as part of your uh, contract with the university. So we've covered, uh, this policy covers the promotions bit. My next task is to extend that to cover appointments to the university and the annual appraisal process for all academic appraisals within the, within the institution. But since it's in the promotions framework, why well, it's going to be a challenge to move it to the other frameworks as well, to appointments and to appraisal. It should be more straightforward because we've already made the, the major leap, which is to put it in the promotions framework. All metrics responsible for use of metrics. I've already begun to talk about this by saying that general impact factor is a waste of time and you shouldn't use it. For most of the practices you're probably currently using it for already, certainly for promotions and for uh, uh, rewards. Uh, and, but if that is a big, that's a big change, to change those policies and to change culture and, and understanding about what the correct evaluation of uh, research outputs is. Uh, and I illustrate this through a, a UK survey uh, that I worked with HEFKI, one of our funding bodies, to um, implement at the end of last year. So these results are just about the UK. But I don't believe that they are significantly different anywhere else in, in Europe uh, either. I think we find the same sorts of answers and the same sorts of conservative approaches to change as we found in this uh, small questionnaire on research metrics. So I drew up a questionnaire of 14 questions and um, we had 96 responses. We have about 170 universities in the UK, so about two thirds of them, no, maybe over half to two thirds, answered the uh, answered the uh, answered the questions. Uh, I'm just going to give a, a, a couple of examples from the question. Yeah, so, question one was: Does your research organisation have a research metrics policy? Do you have a university policy? And she explains: No matter what kind of use you make of evaluation, do you have a policy which everybody has accepted? And everybody has proved, so you're all doing the same thing. But the question is saying, are you basically all doing the same thing in terms of your use of research metrics? Do you have a policy? And look here, 53 named institutions, 75 of the 91 responses said no, you haven't got a policy at all. And yet they're using metrics all over the place in the university to do all kinds of things. And they have no policy which explains to people using them, how, the, how those metrics, what the responsible use of metrics is. So again, back to your universities, does your university have a policy on research metrics? I suspect the answer with respect maybe no, but I, I, so go away and think about that, because in an open science environment, that's completely unacceptable, that you're using metrics in a way without explaining how you're using them and what you're using them for. And this is certainly true in the UK, where most of the respondents didn't have a policy which governed how they were using metrics. 
Uh, another person who wants to ask your research organization signed DORA, the, uh, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Evaluation, which forbids the use of general impact factors uh, to assess quality of academic quality of individual articles. And here, 75 <coughs> uh, institutions said no, they haven't signed it. Uh, 21 said yes, and I'm happy to say that my university was one of the 21 who had signed it. <coughs> We have signed it. So that's the depth of the challenge to change the way you use metrics uh, and evaluation because the current practice is just so deeply embedded in uh, the current system but is so completely alien to the principles and policies of open science. Uh, the last pillar of open science is citizen science and it recognizes the general citizen as an equal player in the research process alongside a university. Uh, uh, researcher and open science principles recommends creating a single institutional point of contact for citizen science. And what we're going to do in my university is to create a citizen science office which will be run by me as the coordinator for citizen science practices across the university but will encourage uh, work with um, university researchers in the institution to engage with society and to bring in the general citizen as co-workers in, 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 in research activity. And that's redefining what the role of the university is, certainly in a metropolitan city like London, where, you're, where citizens and professional researchers are working alongside each other, and it's a partnership and a community building. So that, for us in the West, that's a really important point because it redefines how universities are appreciated by society and the value that people perceive universities give to society as a result of the funding they receive. So what are the conclusions from this tour of open science in uh, Europe and, and what does it look like to implement a roadmap to deliver open science uh, practices? Well, this is a roadmap. Uh, I, I, I think one of our introductory speakers explained that I was a historian, so I am a historian, so many of my examples are historical examples. This is a European Roadmap. It's the largest surviving European uh, roadmap. It's um, called the Mapa Mundi, yeah, the map of the world. It's um, drawn in my country, in Lincoln, on the eastern side of the country, in around the year 13, 1300. And it's a medieval view of, of, of the world, or the known world, yeah, at the beginning of the 14th century. The scribe I don't think they travel very far, because if you look at the Latin names on the map, you can see that he has mixed up his continents, so he calls Africa Europe, and Europe Africa, so I don't think he traveled very far. <coughs> He's doing this from books or from um, uh, second hand, from things that people had told him. But my country is there, right at the edge of the known world in 1400, where we probably will be next year after we leave the Union, but that's a separate, that's a separate discussion. That is England, right at the edge of the known world. In the center of the map, this is not a road map in a geographical sense, it's a theological map, because right in the center of, of the map is, is Jerusalem. So this man's view of the world is a theological view based on the Christian New Testament with Jerusalem and the Holy City right at the center of his world. What we're suggesting in this talk is that you, you, you take the principles but you change the focus. So you do have a roadmap, but instead of putting Jerusalem at the center, you put open science, and then everything else will follow from that discussion. So if you have been listening, thank you very much. I'm very happy to hear questions now, or in the panel session later on uh, in the day. Thank you for your time.